Hey everyone, happy Thursday afternoon. You know what time it is, it's two Eastern and that means it's time for Bold Leaders in Learning. I'm Brandon Busteed, President of University Partners and Global Head of Learn, Work, Innovation at Kaplan. And this is officially our last Bold Leaders in Learning of the year 2020. And we couldn't have a better guest uh, to, to round out the year for us. I'm delighted to have Dr. Jennifer Morton, the author of Moving Up uh, Without, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> I'm blanking on the name of your book now, Jennifer. Uh, you no worries, that? Moving Up Without Losing Your Way. Moving Up Without Losing Your Way, The, the Cost of, of Social Mobility. And I apologize for that, complete mental blank, uh, which is uh, always something that's gonna happen even to the best of us. Um, it's a book that I had the privilege of reading uh, this past summer because I was on a committee for AAC&U uh, to recognize the best book for higher education as part of what's called the Ness Award. And so uh, Jennifer's book was recognized as the Ness Award winner by AAC&U. And, uh, and I would have to agree, all the books I read this year uh, on higher ed, it was the best. So thank you very much for being with me today. And I would love to just have you start by talking a little bit about your background, uh, and then we'll, we'll dive into some discussion about the book. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Brandon. I am excited to be here. This is my first live podcast, I believe. Um, so uh, my work focuses on philosophy of education. And what I've been interested in uh, for the past few years is basically the experiences of first generation and low income students in the college setting. Um, but I come at this as a philosopher, not as a social scientist. And what I uh, got really interested in was the ethical experiences, the kind of ethical challenges that first generation and low income students face. Um, I got interested in this in part through my own personal background. So I grew up in uh, Peru and Lima. Um, and I'm the first person in my family to go to college. I was raised by my working class grandmother, but I, I had a somewhat unusual upbringing in that uh, some extended family paid for me to go to private school. So I was also going to the American School of Lima, one of the most expensive schools in Peru, uh, and, and kind of experiencing this divide between my home life um, and um, my schooling. Um, I came to the United States to go to Princeton, uh, which further magnified this uh, distance that I was already feeling from um, my uh, grandmother and kind of the, the environment I grew up in, in the sense that, um, you know, Princeton was physically distanced from Peru, obviously. Um, so I immigrated, but I, it was also just a very different environment than the one that I had been used to, although my, my private school experience had given me some hint of, of, of that kind of world. Um, so um, I uh, got interested in philosophy and went to get my philosophy PhD. And it wasn't really until I started working at the City University of New York at City College that I started to reflect on some aspects of my own experience as a first generation college student. Um, when I got to City College, I um, was at an institution that is uh, geared towards providing upward mobility to working class kids, the children of immigrants. Most of my students were racial minorities, maybe immigrants themselves or their parents were immigrants. And it was through teaching those students and talking to them and talking about their stories that I kind of reflected on my own experience and also had this insight that some of the challenges my students were experiencing were not just about uh, you know, academics or financial, although many of them had those challenges as well. But a lot of their challenges were about their personal relationships to their families, to their friends, to their communities, and how they were navigating right. in a way being pulled in two different directions. Um, and so that was kind of like the spark of the book. It was uh, my, my experience teaching at the City College of New York. Yeah, I mean, as you describe it, right, it, it, it sounds obvious, right? But, but I think what I was struck by in your book was that, you know, for, for somebody who's done a lot of thinking about higher ed in general, right, and certainly thinking very specifically about first generation students doing lots of research on that uh, during my time at Gallup, 
you know, the, 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 your, you know, kind of framing of the ethical costs of this thing that we hold very dearly, right? This upward mobility is, a, is one of the big promises of higher education, right? Social mobility is this thing that, you know, we all rally behind and say, you know, yes, that's, you know, that's what we want it to accomplish. And in all, me you know, all, all means it's a, you know, it's a powerful, uh, you know, outcome of higher ed. But, you know, I, I have to be honest, like, I hadn't thought deeply about some of those trade-offs, right? And I think, you know, your, your own personal story talks about it, you know, you, you physically left your country, right? You physically left your family and your, you know, your tight home base. Um, and then you were exposed to a world that in many ways, you know, was just very foreign, not just because you were from a different country, but the, you know, the socioeconomic status, the, you know, there's all these things. So, I, you know, I, I, uh, I just think it's, it's one of those books that makes people think very differently than they have in the past about the purpose of higher education, first generation students. And then where your head starts to go is, okay, now that I'm aware of this, right, this, this ethical struggle and choice conflict that, that many of these students have to make, what do I do, right? What's my role in trying to improve the experience for them? How can I support them better? Um, so, you know, tell me a little bit about that. You know, the book balances very nicely between philosophy and very practical examples and points, right? So, you know, take us to what, you know, what kinds of things we need to think about in terms of what we do differently to support first generation students. Yes, thank you, Brandon. So I think the first step it is really, and that was my hope in the book, kind of recognizing this dimension of the student experience. And many of the students I talked to, so it, for the book, I interviewed people who had been successful in the path of upward mobility and were now professionals and had gone through this process themselves. And in the book, I call them strivers. And the strivers I talked to many of them had very conflicted feelings about their path and what they had given up and the choices that had made. But um, this was not reflected in the stories that we tell each other and that we tell students about what upward mobility is supposed to do for them. We rarely tell students a story in which upward mobility comes at a cost, um, that it might make them feel uh, guilty about leaving their families or their communities, that it might make them feel very uh, distant from their families after they spend a lot of time in these more upper middle class and professional environments, um, that they might feel like it's hard for them to understand uh, family and for family to understand them or understand the friends they grew up with and have their friends understand uh, their life now. And so I think yeah. that w one of the uh, things we can do is just be much more explicit and open about that because I think that students deserve to know what they're going in for. Um, and when we tell students these stories that don't quite match up with their experience, um, I think they tend to either ignore those feelings or internalize them or think it reflects badly on them. Um, and and so that's the first step. I think there's also stuff that as professors and people thinking about higher education, we need to think about what we do in the classroom and what kind of classroom environment we provide for, for students and also what kind of college environment. Um, so I think this is very institution dependent, right? So at a place like Harvard or Princeton where I went to undergraduate, uh, the culture is, is dominated by a certain kind of student from a wealthier background who's gone to a very good public high school or a very elite private school. Um, and the sort of uh, ethos of, you know, we're, we're educating the next leaders and all of this stuff can feel, um, as you said, foreign and, and, and sort of off-putting to students who come from very different backgrounds or who didn't grow up with that kind of, um, those kinds of ideas about college. Um, but a place like Princeton or Harvard or Yale have so many resources to help and give support to first generation and low-income students. They have amazing graduation rates. They do the best in terms of graduating st uh, students, all students, but uh, also first generation and low income students. And so at a place like that, you have all of these supports 
you know, and I, and I think uh, a lot of it is just thinking about, okay, how do we get students to connect with each other, to form community, to uh, have mentors and faculty, connect faculty that are first gen with students that are first gen. A lot of stuff is being done. But we have to remember that most first generation and low income students do not go to places like Princeton or Harvard. That's like a very small, narrow slice of the higher education sector. We often right. forget that when we, you know, look at the pages of the paper, the Times or the Washington Post or Forbes, you know, people are writing about like who's getting into these elite places right. and what are these elite places doing? Most first generation low income students are not going to those places. They're going to the City University of New York, Cal State, University of Texas, University of Florida. Um, and those schools are much more limited in what they can do to support first generation college students. So for example, one of the things that we know really works is having students enter college as part of a cohort. That's a small, like 20, right. 25 person class. Um, students take many classes together. So you might take, you know, first year writing class, a math class and a biology class, all with the same 20, 25 people. That, creates a community for those students. So students feel connected to the campus community through that cohort. Through that cohort program, you can provide support in terms of exposing students to what is the writing center doing for you? Or like, uh, if you need psychological help, where do you go? Um, but those programs are very expensive. And so a lot of public institutions do not have um, the money to really make sure that every uh, first generation or low income student gets that kind of cohort experience. Um, although we know that they, it works, that students you know, feel connected, there's higher retention, higher graduation. Um, and so in some ways, like what we can do for the public universities that are educating these students is to some extent, give them the resources they need to really do the support you know, evidence-based work right. uh, that that will lead those students to graduate and to have these high completion rates that um, are are harder um, for a public university to achieve. Yeah, the uh, you know the idea of cohorts and you know certain support networks. I want to come back to because uh, you know one of the things that uh, that your book prompted me to do was write an article about how higher education could start to think about serving the family as a unit of analysis, uh, which is a little bit of a different take on kind of student, you know, cohorts or living learning communities with support, but, but in the same vein of, you know, making sure there's a solid support system that doesn't just recognize the individual, but that, you know, an individual can be more successful in the context of supportive relationships. Um, and, you know, your point, it, you know, it's interesting, you know, your book, it, it it, it, it ties into other things that have been fairly prominent in, uh, you know, in the, you know, recent literature of, of, uh, of books out there, right? So I, I think a little bit about like Hillbilly Elegy um, and, you know, his description of going to the Ivy League, coming from, you know, a very poor family and, um, and a little bit of the, you know, to your point about elite institutions, Tony Jack's book on the privileged poor. Um, so like, you know, you start to piece all these things together. And I think one of the big takeaways is just, you know, we, we all need to have a, uh, a more heightened sensitivity to an awareness of these particular challenges that, that first gen students are facing. And I know that sounds like such a simple, like, yeah, wow, that's, you know, that's not a great insight, but, but that was one of the big things that I really took away from this. And I think where it goes is it can't just be a program, for example, that student affairs runs or, you know, a living learning community or a singular service, I, I do think it comes down to one of the points you made about every single classroom, right? There is an interaction between a faculty member and their students. There's an interaction between students in a classroom. And if a faculty member hasn't taken the time to kind of understand the context of where his or her students are coming from, right? You know, not just to kind of know them academically strengths and weaknesses, but like, to get to know them in a way in terms of where, where they come from. It's, it's really, it's almost impossible to address this in a way that is productive. And of course, there's ways to do it, you know, in the classroom in terms of facilitating discussions and, 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 and a listening perspectives. But you talk a lot about the, you know, the one-on-one -on -one time that you personally have had with students 
um, and tried to encourage. So, I mean, just tell me as a, as a, as a professor, right? How do you, how do you balance this in the classroom, right? And then how do you make that effort to sustain, uh, you know, regular contact with, with students in a one-on-one -on -one fashion outside the classroom? That's not easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's uh, a really good question. Let me th kind of back up a little bit to something you say earlier, and then I'll return to this. I think the important point that uh, I hope to highlight in my book is that the lack of certain social supports in our society, childcare, elder care, health care, um, you know, we're seeing this during the pandemic, school, uh, falls often on college students or college age uh, young people, right? And so um, what I saw when I was at CUNY was that a lot of my students were playing these support roles for their families. They're the default backup childcare. They're the default take the grandmother to the hospital or, you know, stay taking care of a sick sibling. So they're doing a lot of this social support for their families um, or taking on a full time job or you're going to college full time to support, you know, like a disabled uh, parent, which I, I had multiple students who did that. Um, and so it's really important to recognize that these failures of our society to provide support for families, as you said, I think that's the right unit of analysis for families and all of these domains end up falling on the college age student if that family cannot find some other source of support, right? And so um, the, the student is coming to college with all of that on them. So if they're going to a residential college, like they come to UNC, they're taking something from their family in a way that, and then they're going to feel guilty, right? So they're not there to help if, uh, you know, a cousin or their sibling has to be home from school or um, if, you know, a parent needs help, especially right now with COVID. Um, but if they stay home, they're also constantly struggling balancing these two uh, considerations. And I saw that with at CUNY when many of my students are living at home. So then every day yeah. it becomes, am I going to do this for my family? I see them struggling, or am I going to study or go to class or take the exam? And so I think having awareness of that is really important, um, as you said, but I think also uh, professors, I think, can do a better job of um, making sure that what they're providing for their students in the classroom is not just, you know, learning the academic stuff that you need to learn, though that's important and absolutely critical. But I think there are ways to teach students where you're also giving them a chance to develop new relationships, to be mentored by faculty, to connect with each other. Um, this was especially true uh, when I was at CUNY because students had so much going on outside of school, they got to class and then they were right back out for a job or, you know, whatever responsibilities they had. They didn't kind of hang around campus necessarily or have the time to do that. Right. So the classroom was this like very special place for them to really get to know each other and make friends. And I had a number of students who emailed me and said, you know, this is the first time I've actually become friends with the other people in my classes. Uh, I'm like, I have no time. I leave right after classes I done. I'm go home or go to my job or whatever. And this is the first time I've had that opportunity. And I think professors can be really mindful about what they do in the classroom to, to enable students to form those relationships. Yeah. But then it, there is a lot of work that falls on the faculty and in particular, you know, I tell my students, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. They look at me, they know I'm Latina. And so some students are just they're comfortable coming to my office hours and talking to me in a way they might not to another professor. And that can create a lot of emotional burden on faculty, right? So you right. have students like, you know, crying in your, in your during office hours or, uh, you know, telling you very difficult, personal, just awful things that are going on in their lives. And, um, and, and what I think one of the most frustrating things for faculty, it was true for me when I was at CUNY, is this sense that you don't have the resources to offer students uh, a, a, you know, the, what they need, for example, right? Like 
especially if you're at a cash strap public institution, you might no. say like, I can see that if I, you know, I've also taught at a place like Swarthmore, a very well researched liberal arts college. I can see that if I was at a different institution, I could call someone and you could get some emergency financial aid, or maybe you could get like a quick appointment with like a therapist, or, you know, we could get you all, all sorts of resources that might be available. But in these public universities, it's really hard because faculty then feel kind of powerless about their ability to um, help students navigate those situations. But I think listening and being open it's so valuable to the students. It, it just, even if you can't do anything, they just feel like somebody heard them and somebody in a position of authority is listening to what they're saying and not, uh, you know, kind of immediately jumping to conclusions that they're not good students or they're not motivated or they're lazy or you right. know, whatever other stuff they might've heard from other faculty. And I think that can be really powerful. Yeah, I, well, I think you've, you've mentioned a number of things that are really important. And, and of course, as you as you also noted, not easy to do, right? I mean, you know, you as a faculty member can take on that burden of, you know, being a, you know, a social, uh, you know, respite for for these students who otherwise don't don't have it in other places. And you're right, too. Like the other thing that jumped out in the book was, you know, that a, that a, a lot of these students are, in fact, the the kind of rock of their own family, right? Where their family is, you know, leaning on them, relying on them, looking up to them, right? Um, and so, you know, it's just amazing all the different burdens they carry. I mean, you know, it, it, it and, and it translates into some of the things you mentioned. I couldn't make it to class. Why didn't you make it to class? Well, it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, the fact that I'm lazy. My grandmother was sick. I had to take her to the hospital. I had, you know, it's just, there were story after story of that in the book. And again, you know, not things that I haven't heard before, but you just brought it out in a way where it was a, you know, palpable reckoning where, you know, we, we still aren't doing a great job when I say we collectively, um, you know, understanding uh, where students are coming from and trying to help them in unique ways. So, you know, going back to this uh, concept of universities trying to think about you know, how they might serve the, the family as a unit of analysis, right? The idea that I wrote about is, you know, fairly straightforward on one hand, uh, probably harder to execute on the other, but, you know, a student gets accepted into a college or university and, you know, the relationship is with that student and, you know, the parents or family might be helping pay for tuition, but otherwise, you know, they drop off or they, you know, show up for graduation or whatever it is and don't really have a role. But there were all these other examples, right? Like, um, if uh, family members don't uh, aren't native English speakers, right? Could the university offer to provide family members with English language classes, right? Could uh, you know a parent get to enroll in courses where they could audit the classes, right? So they're not an enrolled student, they're not trying to get a degree, but they could actually you know be able to tap into you know the existing educational offerings that are at the institution. What about access to library resources or? You know, I mean, you, you could go on and on with the examples, but the idea would be that when a student is accepted, yes, they're the degree seeking candidate, but their family members uh, can kind of come along for the ride, either virtually or, uh, you know, thinking about some, you know, kind of physical campus example. So I'm curious to just, you know, have you riff with me on this idea, because um, I know you read the, you know, the short article yeah. that I wrote about it, um, but like, you know, what would you say about that? Like, what would you what would you add to enhance the the idea or concept? Yeah, I think those are all great ideas. I think ex having a way for the university to communicate with families in a way that isn't, uh, you know, it, it's it's very complicated, especially if you're at an elite university where there is going to be this difference, right, between uh, the standing that we attribute to people who are at a, an elite school or, or even, you know, at a very good, like, public university and uh, the family self-conception of themselves or, like, you know, what's going on in their communities. If they don't have a college degree, they might feel, you know, nervous and um, unsure about how to communicate with the university, but I think thinking like intentionally as you were doing in that piece about what that communication is, right? I, um, when I was growing up, 
uh, I was going to the American school, which was all in English. We had one class in Spanish we from Peru or maybe two classes, but everything was in English. And a lot of the communication from the school to the families was in English. And my grandmother didn't speak English. And so I had to do all this work of translating. And basically I would get like the form for the parent and just tell my grandmother, okay, this is what it says, just sign here, right? Like I was doing all of this, like the parenting work of uh, thinking through that stuff. And, and I think a lot of students find themselves in that situation, first generation students, low income students when they're going to college and they can't quite figure out how to explain to their families or talk to their families they do some of the translating. They don't want their families to worry about how they're doing. Uh, so they might shield their families from problems they're having or challenges they're encountering. And, and the family feels somewhat left out, right? Like left out of, yeah. out of this experience or maybe like they don't quite understand what's going on or what the student um, is doing or needs to be doing. And so I think being mindful about those connections would be really great. And I um, I know that at CUNY, we had a program for admissions day where families were invited and it's somewhat easier to place, you know, like uh, uh, CUNY where a lot of the students live in the New York area. Um, you know, it's much more difficult um, at a place like uh, Carolina or, or some other places where you get students from all over the state. Um, but, but yeah, I think colleges and universities could do a lot more to think about the family as an important component of uh, how they can make first generation and low income students feel welcome and, and feel like they can succeed. Um, and in a way that doesn't make the student feel very separate and distant from their family. Yeah, I mean, I take, you know, th this isn't, you know, the exact example, but, um... You know, you look at a lot of universities that have established very, very engaged parent outreach programs. Now, granted, a lot of it's been framed around fundraising uh, from parents, but it is a good example of functions that universities have built that um, have really reached out, engaged parents, engaged parents in parts of the experience that they never used to before. Um, so, I mean, I do see examples of it, right? Maybe not framed specifically around how we support first gen students. Um, and before we run out of time, right, it, it's hard not to have a conversation about this and, and not bring up the impact of COVID, right, and mm -hmm. what's happening in a pandemic. So, you know, t just tell me some of your thoughts. I mean, we, we were talking about the enrollment declines this year and, you know, yeah. big hit to community college enrollments and, you know, areas where, you know, as we know, disproportionately first generation students you know, it's easy to kind of make an argument that they've also been disproportionately, uh, you know, hit by this pandemic. What, you know, what do we need to do now and coming out of the pandemic as, as, as you kind of think about from that perspective? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I worry a lot about the impacts on the inequality in the higher education system. We're already seeing this in terms of the institutions that can weather the storm and the institutions that are financially unable to weather this situation. But I think in terms of the student perspective, um, I guess because we're almost out of time, I will, I will turn to my silver lining. <laughs> I think that um, this uh, experience of being on Zoom and taking classes on Zoom has shown us the importance of the social and emotional engagement the students have with each other and with faculty and how much that matters for students learning, for them being motivated. Um, so I think there was a point in time a number of years ago where people thought that uh, online education was going to erase inequalities in higher education and provide access to uh, people from low income backgrounds. Um, and I think we're seeing now that that's a flawed model. It's not to say that there's no place for online learning, but that the students come to college not just to learn some content. They also come to college to become a part of a new community, to uh, you know, become professionals who can hang out with other professionals and have friends who are similar in similar positions to them and, and to be mentored by faculty and, and to be exposed to all of these aspects of college that they might not fully understand beyond academics. And 
it's much harder to do that over Zoom. We're all finding out. And students feel disconnected and disengaged. Yeah. And so I hope that this will prompt us to, to value again this aspect of uh, education. Um, I also hope that it will make faculty uh, rethink the lecture model of education where they're just commit because it really does not work on Zoom. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so yeah, those are, I, I think those are some silver linings. I think hopefully we'll come out of this with an appreciation for why uh, having a discussion in, in a seminar room with like, you know, 25 other people is, it's a much more engaging and joyful way to learn than listening to a Zoom lecture and then, you know, writing a, a short essay in response to it. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a good reminder that, uh, you know, the best learning really only starts to happen when, when learners are emotionally connected to what they're learning. And a lot of that has to do with the, you know, the human uh, part of this equation. So uh, good, a good, good way to, to finish and uh, again, can't thank you enough. Congratulations on your book. For those of you who haven't gotten it yet, uh, Moving Up Without Losing Your Way is a must read. Uh, I hope you're clicking on Amazon right now to buy it. And um, in any event, Jennifer, thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to following your future writing and whatever new books are coming out, I will uh, certainly be the first to read them. So with that, uh, I wanna thank you all for a great 2020 season of Bold Leaders and Learning. We'll be back in the new year. I hope you all have a, a restful holiday break. So thanks so much. And thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon and Dan and everybody else who's involved in this. <laughs>